What an honor to uh, be able to introduce uh, Leo Chavez uh, today to this Haven Rights Center um, visiting scholar um, program lecture. Uh, you know, Leo, Leo is, uh, is much more than, than, a, than a mentor, but he is a person that has provided a path for many of us who study race, immigration, ethnicity, uh, a path to, to, to think about how these social dynamics um, shape, not just, uh, not just us personally, but, but society at large. Um, Dr. Chavez received his, P his PhD in anthropology from Stanford University. His research has focused on various aspects of the migration experience, families, work, immigration status, access to healthcare, cancer in Latinas, and media representation. In addition to scores of academic articles, he is the author of Shadow Lives, Undocumented Immigrants in American Society, first edition in 1992 and the third edition in 2013, covering immigration, popular images in the politics of the nation, University of California Press, 2001, The Latino Threat, Constructing Immigrant Citizens in the Nation, Stanford University Press, first edition in 2008, second edition in 2013, and Anchor Babies in the Challenge of Birthright Citizenship, Stanford University Press, 2017. His current research examines the effects of political rhetoric, especially anti-Latino and anti-immigrant rhetoric, rhetoric on emotions and psychological well-being. Dr. Chavez has received several awards over his career. In 1992, he received the UC Irvine's Lods and Laurels Award for Distinguished Teacher. He received the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association and the Society for Applied Anthropology in 1993. The Association of Latina and Latino Anthropologists Book Award for the Latino Threat in 2009, and the Society for Anthropology of North America's Award for Distinguished Achievement in the Critical Study of North America in 2009. Dr. Chavez was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2018. In 2019, the Association of Latina and Latino Anthropologist honored him with the Distinguished Career Award. And the Society for Applied Anthropology awarded him the Bronislaw Malinowski Award in 2021 for distinguished lifetime contributions. That, those are just several of, um, of his, his professional uh, contributions that Dr. Chavez has, has had over the course of his career. He, in my estimation, he has also uh, had a wide impact on almost, you know, every every region of the U.S. through his mentorship of students. Um, as 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 Patrick mentioned, I am one of Leo's students, and I know many many more that are in professions both in academia and in other places um, doing some some critical and needed work. Um, Leo um, was a person that that actually took stock in me by, by, by helping me finance um, the first three years of my graduate school career through his research center. And I will forever be indebted with you, Leo. And um, I am so excited to be able to, uh, to, to listen to your presentation and welcome. Thank you. Is it to me? All right, I hope you can hear me. Um, well, first of all, I wanna thank Patrick and Armando for inviting me um, and uh, thank Armando for all those kind words. And I have to say, he's done, he's done great with his academic career despite my early interventions. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's always great to see. Uh, it, it's sort of like do no damage and, and hopefully they'll prosper. Um, and I think, um, I'd like, also like to thank the Havens Rights Center for Social Justice and the University of Wisconsin-Madison for inviting me out. It's always great to come and meet new people, even if it's on Zoom rather than in person. Um, and uh, I look forward to doing the best part of a talk for me, which is answering questions, um, because you know you can't cover everything uh, in a talk, and, and I'll be kind of cutting it as I go along. So what I want to do is go ahead and share my screen. and. Um,
see how this works. Armando, can you see it? We see it, but um, we see your entire, there it is. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so yeah, as uh, was already mentioned, the title of my talk is The Emotional Toll of Anti-Immigrant and Anti-Latino Political Rhetoric, and um, which I'll get to the, at the end of the talk, but I'm gonna put it in the context first. And I wanna start with um, some uh, bits of information uh, from the recently released 2020 US Census. Um, number one, America is a graying population. We're getting older. Uh, you know, the projections are that the 65 and older will double in size in the next coming decades. You know, those of us who are at that age already are gonna go from 15% of the population in 2016 to almost 25% in 2060. So we're a nation that's becoming increasingly older. The US Census also indicated some trends that I've been writing about for a decade at least now, uh, and just reaffirms those patterns. For example, the white population, has, or as they put it, the non-Hispanic white, uh, is projected to shrink considerably in coming decades. This isn't new, we've been projecting this a while, but the, US, the 2020 Census really sort of confirms that pattern. By 2045, non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority of the US population. This decline is driven by aging, as I just mentioned, we're an aging population. And since they're the uh, group that's aging fastest and the largest group at this point, uh, aging population is affecting them tremendously. They also have low fertility rates. They don't have that many births per woman. They also have falling birth rates, for example, uh, in 2030, it's projected that whites will have nine babies per 1,000 people, and uh, uh, that's not very many. And they also, by 2030, will have 12 deaths per 1,000 person. As you can see, more whites are dying than are being born. So you add that to low fertility, which means fewer kids being born, more people dying than, 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 than having babies, and aging population creates a dynamic situation for demographic change. Just to kind of give you a sense of what was already out before the 2020 census, you see here on this map, fewer births and deaths among whites in a majority of US states. You know, basically some people have called these deaths of despair related to Oxycontin, related to depression over changing demographics, related to the realization that the growing inequality in America has affected uh, working class whites tremendously. Uh, and so some people say these deaths are deaths of, of, of depression and um, uh, in response to a, a what they perceive as losing ground. Let's look at what the 2020 census tells us about the change in demographics and, and the probably, I, you know, so much I could look at, but I, I just wanna to touch on these to move to my talk is that look at the group that's probably the most dynamic group for understanding the future. Children in the United States under age 18. In 2020, the non-Hispanic whites will become a minority in this group, 49.8%. Hispanics in 2020 are 25.5%, the one out of four children under 18 are, are Latino. By 2060, whites are projected to decline to 36%, just above one third of all children in the United States. Latinos are gonna be almost a third. So the, the numbers are gonna come parallel. It could become sort of towards each other with whites coming down, Latinos coming up. So what does this tell us? This tells us that these dynamics, aging population, deaths, few births, uh, and, and, and these kind of dynamics have an influence on the future in terms of our population dynamics, also in terms of the demand for immigrant labor. We're in a capitalist country and a capitalist system, which means you know, we wanna create more jobs today than we did yesterday as this arrow indicates. Otherwise, if that arrow flattens out, we get a recession. And if it stays flat, we get a depression. No one wants that. So in capitalism, we want more jobs today than yesterday. Unfortunately, if you don't have the births because you have low fertility rates, aging populations, 
and people don't have you know, are just aren't reproducing at rates that create children. Children in an economy are basically future workers. So if you have all these indications that we've already seen that the 2020 census sort of confirms, fewer births in the United States, aging population, but a capitalist economy, what do you have? A demand for immigrant labor. Now, <clears throat> the 2020 census projections sort of underscores this. So that immigration in 2020, those who are foreign born in the United States accounted for about 14% of the population. Because of these changing demographics, the demand for foreign labor is gonna go up. And by 2060, foreign born will account for 17% of the population. So you know, this, these are all projections and dynamics that we've already known for a long time. What I wanna look at is these somewhat objective demographic changes are interpreted by people either positively or negatively. And unfortunately, they were, have been interpreted relatively negatively in terms of Latinos. What I'm looking at then is the growth of blaming and scapegoating of Latinos for these demographic changes. And then finally, what's it mean for people who are scapegoated and the targets of rhetoric that causes calls them the problem? Let me back up for a second. Just to remind us that you know the current, the, the, the more recent anti-immigrant, anti-Latino rhetoric we've seen in, pub, in public discourse it hasn't always been the same. You know, when I started looking at this, and I'll get back to it in a second, uh, back in the 70s and 80s, it was more relatively, not evenly divided, but there was a lot of pro-immigration public discourse and anti-immigration public discourse. Just to remind you, in 1980, at this presidential debate between George Bush the I and Ronald Reagan, both of whom would eventually become president of the United States, somebody asked the question, because in 1980, immigration was going up and people started becoming alarmist over the future. And so somebody asked the question, do you think the children of illegal immigrants should attend schools for free? Or do you think their parents should pay for their education? George Bush said, we have made illegal sometimes the labor I would like to see legal. We're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family loving people that are in violation of the law. And second, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. If they're living here, I don't wanna see six and eight year old kids made totally uneducated, made to feel they are living outside the law. These are good people, strong people. So then everyone turned to Ronald Reagan, the father of American conservatism in America for the next 20 years and to see what he would say. Now, surprisingly, he outdid George Bush. He said, rather than talking about putting up a fence, sound familiar? Why don't we work out some recognition of our mutual problems? Make it possible for them to come here legally with the work permit. And then when they want to go back, they can go back. Open the borders both ways. And it's almost hard to imagine two Republicans who would become president talking positively about immigration, talking about open borders, and talking about people who are decent people coming to the United States to set down roots. When the idea of amnesty came up, when Ronald Reagan was president, he said, I believe in the idea of amnesty for those who have put down roots and have lived here, even though some time back they may have entered illegally. I mean, what changed? What has changed? You know, how, how did these succeeding periods of, of recession, low, low unemployment, and increasing changes in the demography of those coming to the United States lead to anti-immigrant and anti-Latino rhetoric? On March 7th, 1983, U.S. News and World Report published this, this issue. And on the cover, it says, invasion from Mexico, it just keeps growing. I was writing my first book and doing the research for my first book, um, uh, Shadowed Lives. And, you know, I, I was interested in this mainly for the article. But that magazine cover sat on my desk for years. And I kept thinking, you know, oh, I kept thinking, you know, what's going on here? What's, what's this article talking about? And why is the image, what's the image saying? How can I analyze the image? And so I asked myself, how do I read this image? And what's the larger narrative that this image is, is subtly trying to dis, uh, create a discussion about in the minds of the American public? Answering that, those two questions basically led to 30 years plus of my work. It led me to 
uh, think about how media represents the nation, citizens, and immigration. It led me to think about how Latinos are characterized as a threat to the nation. It led me to ask why the children of immigrants are targeted as a problem. When did it, how did it shift from immigrants being a problem to their children, many of whom are US born American citizens. So my, the whole trajectory of my research over the next 30 something years, in a way I can blame on that magazine sitting on my desk and, and making me think, what does it mean? Finally, it, it led me to ask my more, more current research, what's the impact of political rhetoric on those who, whom it targets? I'm gonna go back to this cover. In the 1990s, I began to study magazine covers and their articles dealing with immigration. And I did looked at from 1965 to 2000. And I published that data and information in a book called Covering Immigration. And on the cover, you can see a whole bunch of little snippets of some of the covers I was looking at. What I was interested in are, were metaphors, visual metaphors and metaphors in writing or discursive to help us think about abstract or complex ideas like what's the nation? Who's a member of the nation? What's it mean to belong to the nation? What is citizenship? How has citizenship changed? Is citizenship a fixed idea or is it an idea that's in progress, that's changing? And what about immigration? You know, what's, how do metaphors help us T tell a story about immigration to the United States of America. Let me give you an example of how I looked at then some of these metaphors visually and, and particularly. You'll see here water, then you'll see here the Statue of Liberty, which is a metaphor, a visual metaphor for the nation. She represents us as a people. Water, which represents the flood, the flood of immigrants. And you see the water or the flood is coming up and bear and basically drowning the Statue of Liberty already. Her nose is inundated. She's drowning in the flood of immigrants coming to the United States. So that's a set of visual metaphors that gives us a sense of an of an, of a, a alarmist story or narrative about immigration. It's 1992 and or 93, and it's basically a period of heightened unemployment, economic recession and growing immigration to the United States, particularly from Asia and Latin America. Now, you'll notice the little boats represent our, our metaphors for immigrants, and they're dark people, they're brown, black people. And so it's a period particularly of Haitian and Jamaican migration. And so it's saying these Caribbean folks are part of this wave of immigration that's drowning the nation. And so that's a pretty interesting way to go from visual metaphors to a narrative of who we are as a people and the kind of threat immigrants pose to us. <clears throat> Going back then to the original cover, invasion from Mexico, it just keeps growing from March 7th, 1983, also a period of recession, high unemployment, and a period when people started saying, wait, who are all these new people coming to the United States from Asia, from Latin America, and some from Africa, and what's happening to the nation? And who are we going to blame for some of these changes? And so you start seeing in the late 70s, early 80s, this idea that we're being invaded by immigrants. Not only are we being inundated as the water metaphor, but we're actually being invaded as the war metaphor suggests. Because invasion is a war metaphor. Your friends don't come over and invade your house to watch the Super Bowl, right? Or to watch a soccer game. Your enemies invade to take over your country, to, to your land, destroy your way of life. And it just keeps growing, this invasion from Mexico. And so I had to ask myself, wow, Huh? What's going on here? How do I interpret this? And the way I looked at it was that I'm seeing this war metaphor called invasion, but a visual metaphor of people walking across water who are brown people, right? Which sort of gives you the metaphor of the wetback. And they're not carrying weapons or bazookas or planes. They're carrying women, a woman across into the United States. For me, this became very important because it told me the story and narrative they're trying to tell America is that we're being invaded and it's the most insidious invasion of all because it's people bringing their baby makers. They're bringing fertility, reproduction. And this is going to lead to demographic change. This is gonna to lead to a reconquest of the United States as people create families, neighborhoods, take over certain sections of the United States. And it also shifts the, the, the problem not just from the parents who are being coming across and creating families, 
but the very families of those immigrants, their children, who become part of this new narrative of the, of the danger of immigration to the future demographics and, and of the United States. So I started, I wrote a second book after that. I wrote another book after that called The Latino Threat because I, I, I couldn't write it all in the, that other book about coming immigration where I really tried to figure out what this narrative meant and expand on it to deconstruct it somewhat. And you know, to try and look at how over 50 years, the idea of immigrants as criminals became much more emphasized, which isn't true. I don't necessarily have time in this talk to, to, to do, show you why. That Latinos don't want to be part of the nation. They're unassimilable because of genetic problems or whatever problems. They just don't ever, can't ever become part of the values and whatever it means to be American. They don't want to associate with non-Latinos. They don't want to intermarry. They don't want to have friends, all of which the data shows aren't true. They only want to speak Spanish, which isn't true. The children of immigrants in particular of, from anywhere in the world who come to the United States tend to pick up English, even if they retain their bilingual capabilities. And the idea that Latinos take from US society and don't contribute was part of this Latino threat narrative. And so I wrote a book about that and I tried to debunk a lot of it and, and also look at the way it plays out. One of the key things going back to that initial image was what I call the Latina fertility threat narrative because it is so fundamental to everything. The idea that Latinas can't control their, 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 their births. They're, part, they're sucked in by the Catholic church, by culture that says the only way you can be a woman is to have as many kids as possible. And a man to be a man, to be macho, has to impregnate as many women as possible. The idea that Latinos are immutable, that their fertility rates never change because of these cultural factors, that they're always gonna have a lot of kids, and this becomes the basis of the invasion idea of Mexicans in the Southwest as they reconquest the Southwest through fertility and demographic change. In other words, Latinos, particularly people of Mexican descent, became the targets of public discourse. They were blamed for demographic change. And as we'll see, most importantly, they became part of this narrative of whites being replaced in America by non-white people. The displacement, the replacement metaphor that's become very popular as we, if I, and I have time to show you among white nationalists across the world, that they're being replaced through demographic change, through births and through immigration. This idea really pops up in, April, in, in the 1990s. And as an anthropologist, I'm always looking for key phrases that, that sort of characterize an era. And in the late 80s, early 90s, the idea of a browning of America emerges in public discourse and public rhetoric. And you can see it in this cover. Once again, the metaphor of the flag is for the nation. The white stripes and the white stars are metaphors for white people in America. And you'll notice time is telling you that the nation represented by the flag is no longer made up of whites. The white stars are gone. The white stripes are being squeezed out by black people, brown people, and yellow, yellow people. And they, they basically focused on this idea and they thought it was so important they created an advertisement to put in People Magazine and other places that showed all these people of babies of color. Remember I told you, babies under 18 in America, whites are becoming a less part of that. And you see it here. There's only one white baby down at the bottom on the right. All the rest are basically Latinos and blacks and a couple of Asians. And it says here, hey, whitey, your turn at the back of the bus. Sometime soon, white Americans will become a distinct minority, as the 2020 census is telling us still. And, 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 it's good part, and, and basically, it's basically an, an alarmist saying, view saying, when they take over demographically, they're going to put you on the back of the bus. Right? This idea that somehow they're going to be vindictive and treat you the way, historically, you might say that you treated them. And so it's a very scary scenario, this act, this demographic change. It's not a positive story. It's not a positive story of like Southern California where there's incredible creativity and food and culture and music. This is a scary narrative. <coughs> and, they, and here's what they said. The browning of America will alter everything in society from politics and education to industry, values and culture. White Americans are accustomed to thinking of themselves as the very picture of their nation. So what they're saying is that this cult, the new people, the brand of America, the demographic changes that have taken place, 
are going to create a sense among white people that they don't belong. That's not the country that they understand. They went on to say that while the know nothingism is generally confined to the more dismal corners of the American psyche, it seems all too predictable that during the next decade, next decades, many more mainstream white Americans will begin to speak openly about the nation they feel they are losing. Think, I mean, I, I, just to the side here, think up to 2016, the, the, the um, uh, <laughs> presidential campaign, this idea was basically one of the things that, that Trump used to rile up his, his base. The idea that white Americans were missing out and that Latinos in particular were the problem. So this is basically, you know, 26 years, before, 20 something years before Donald Trump. So he didn't make any of that up. This media was already priming the pump of this problem. And so I found that Time Magazine in 1990 was very prescient because 30 years later, we're in the middle of a new nativism where issues of fertility, birth rates, demographic change have become key, at least my understanding of current trends, including the rise of white nationalism, Trumpism's populist appeal to those fearing a new America and its demographic future. So in 1990, they predicted a lot of this. I thought it was pretty interesting. And you can see it in the public discourse, the media. This becomes basically something that's it becomes part of this public discourse. Foreign policy, cover of the magazine, a little cherub baby with blue eyes, wanted more babies. Why the end of the population explosion is a mixed blessing. Not enough of these blue-eyed babies. Samuel Huntington, you know, he basically wrote a book about Muslims uh, and the class of civilizations, and he's looking around for another group to target as a threat. And so he picks on Latinos, and he wrote, writes, writes about it in articles, a book, and this is a cover of foreign policy. He says, Jose, can you see Samuel Huntington on how Hispanic immigrants threaten America's identity, values, and ways of life? And why did they do that for Samuel Huntington? Because in the single most immediate uh, uh, most serious challenge to America's traditional identity comes from immense and continuing immigration from Latin America, especially from Mexico, and the fertility rates of those immigrants compared to black and white American natives. So it's fertility leading demographic change along with immigration that's gonna change the demographic face of America. Blaming, targeting Latinos. I mean, you see it, uh, I could just go on all, you know, I don't have time to show you so many examples that exist. But, you know, Tucker Carlson, T Tucker Carlson is fond of, of critiquing immigration, particularly from Mexico. We're getting waves of people with high school education or less. Our leaders demand that you shut up and accept this. We have a moral obligation to admit the world's poor, they tell us, even if it makes our own country poor and dirtier and more divided. There's no positive aspect to immigration here. Laura Ingram, of course, in some parts of our country, it does seem like America that we know and love doesn't exist anymore. Massive demographic changes have been foisted upon the American people, and they are changes that none of us ever voted for, and most of us don't like. Stephen King, Republican from Iowa, in 2017 said, culture and demographics are our destiny. We can't restore our civilization with somebody else's babies. And of course, if you go back to that magazine advertisement with all those little babies of color, those are the babies who can't restore our civilization that he's talking about. In June 15, 2018, Representative David Stringer from Arizona said, immigration today represents an existential threat to the US and there aren't enough white kids to go around. So this idea, that comes out of what we see in the 2020 uh, census has already been presented for 20, 30 years that demographic change, immigration, fertility rates are leading to dangerous birth rates. It, that's gonna cause a replacement of white population in the United States, but also among nationalists through this around the world. It's not just the United States. In that 2018, the White Manif uh, Nationalist Manifesto was published and you can see the chapters that basically focus on this idea, white extinction, white genocide, 
restoring white homelands, white nationalism is inevitable. And the basic problem here, particularly are Latinos. Their fertility rates, their, demo, their, their, their immigration rates, and their takeover of the United States. I don't have a lot of time. You can ask me for my articles to show you that a lot of this issues and, and idea about Latinos don't change their fertility rates, that they're having too many babies, it's just wrong. I mean, this is a, from the earlier census in 2020, and you can see the top line are Mexican origin women of 18 to 44, which is the demographic that has kids typically, dropping from 70 to two, 1970 to 2000 dramatically. White women drop too, but not even as fast as, as, as Mexican origin women. They, they, particularly by the second and third generation, the children of immigrants are pretty much similar in fertility rates to Anglo women. It's, it's such a bogus issue. And yet you have this discourse about the danger of the Latinas and their fertility and their birth rates and their immigration as this narrative that continues to be repeated and repeated until it becomes truth. And Donald Trump was able to you know, basically use that tremendously. But also it's led to not just discourse, but real dangers. In, on, in, on August 3rd, 2019, Patrick Crucius killed 22 people at a Walmart in El Paso. Why? He allegedly posted online a manifesto in which he claimed his actions were in defense of an Hispanic invasion of Texas. He didn't make that up. Donald Trump didn't make that up. We've already heard this in the press, in the media for 30 years. But you know, you can still ratchet up this idea. Donald Trump ran roughly 2,200 Facebook ads using the word invasion between May 2018 and August 2019. It whips people up. It makes them feel the country's at, at the point of being taken over. And what's important for me then is that this idea that the children of immigrants are the spear point of this invasion. They become the problem. And so I wrote a book thinking, well, what does this mean? What's going on? called Anchor Babies and the Challenge of Birthright Citizenship. Because in 2015, 2016, this has become such an important part of public discourse. And so what I did was I searched for the word anchor babies and birthright citizenship uh, from 1900 to 2010, but really focused in the book on 2000, 1965 to 2010, just to see when this word became popular. Because you know we've always had birthright citizenship, but we haven't had the word anchor baby. And so my question was, when did anchor babies, US citizens become the problem? And why did the word anchor babies appear? And you know, to remind you, anyone born in the US is a citizen thanks to the 14th amendment. And it's, really, it's a positive idea, it's inclusion, not just by blood, like in many countries of the world, where your father has to have be Saudi or German or something else, it's an idea that you can be born into the nation, okay? So what happens, how do you turn citizens who are like everyone else into suspect citizens? Well, you create a term that allows you put them, to put them into a category that says, wait a minute, they're American citizens, but they're not like the rest of us. And by doing this, you question their citizenship. You basically suggest they're not really citizens, that they don't belong and that somehow they're part of a narrative of belonging to families that are trying to cheat the United States because they're hoping these kids can be, help them become legal residents in 21 years. So they're part of a conspiracy against the United States. And so Anchor Baby starts to take on this really ominous, negative way of putting people into these categories, these children. And you see it going all the way back to 2003, well before Trump started using it in 2015 and 2016, in California, not too far from where I live, where Barbara Coe says, said, because they are born here, they end up funding the needs of the entire illegal alien family. It's a tremendous welcome mat for illegal aliens. And you start seeing visual images like this, welcome to California. And it has a woman with the metaphor of the Mexican flag on her. And in her belly is a baby shaped like an anchor with the American flag representing the fact this baby will be an American citizen. Of course, Donald Trump used this as part of his tropes when he was running for president. And he said, they Americans are disgusted when a woman who's nine months pregnant walks across the border, has a baby, and you have to take care of that baby for the next 85 years. First of all, 
my wife's had two kids. I can't imagine her at nine months walking across 140 degree heat at the Arizona desert. I mean, I like to see Donald Trump do it even today, actually. It's, it's almost impossible to do that. And the idea that for 85 years, these kids are gonna be a burden on the United States. They don't contribute, they don't make contributions, they don't get educated, they, they basically exist on the welfare of the United States is, is an idea that really per permeates the Latino threat narrative that he's basically reflecting here. And so anchor babies, I found, became this political rhetoric of them as undeserving citizens, as people who are a threat to the nation. And there have been bills in Congress since the early 1990s to get rid of birthright citizenship, if you can believe that. So out of that came the question from my more current research. After all these decades of anti-immigrant, anti-Latino rhetoric, what does it feel like if you're the target of that rhetoric? What is it, what kind of psychological issues occur? And just let me give you a quote here. It came out in the newspaper. In 2018, a white woman in Running Springs, California, approached Esteban Guzman, a citizen of the United States and his mother who were gardening and told them, go back to Mexico and unleashed other anti-Mexican rants. Guzman looked up shocked. Why do you hate us? And she said, because you're Mexicans. And he said, but we're honest people. And the woman laughed and said, you're rapists, you're drug dealers. Even the president of the United States says you're a rapist. And Guzman turns to the reporter and says, thanks to him, Donald Trump, everywhere I go, I'm a rapist, an animal, a drug dealer. You don't know what it feels like to be hated so much. So the, the study I did in conjunction with Belinda Campos, a psychologist in Chicano Latino you know, Studies here at UC Irvine, was to ask that question. What does it feel like? What, what's the psychological effects of political rhetoric? And so we set up a, uh, an experiment. We showed 95 college students of American, Mexican heritage here at UC Irvine, negative political rhetoric about Latinos and immigrants of the sort I just showed you in this talk and showed 93 positive political rhetoric. And we asked them, and we showed them two statements and two images of each of those positive and negative rhetoric. So one half, basically got the negative rhetoric, one half got the positive. And we asked them to write open-ended questions. How do you feel when you see these state, these kind of political rhetoric? And what do, you, what do you think? So we wanted to get a sense of both their feelings and their sort of rational thought about these images. And you can kind of see here in this un, uncoded response to the key words that came out in their statements. You can see here, they were angry, they were hurt, they, they were sad, they were disturbed, and they also came up with not just emotional responses, but a set of critiques that people were, these, these ideas were ignorant, that they dehumanized people, they were derogatory, they were discriminated, they were racist, they were stereotypes, right? So our job then was to code these and come up with ways of thinking about what the responses were. What we found was that words can hurt people. You think they're just hearing some candidate or <clears throat> some talk show host saying these things or some news magazine saying it on the cover, you're, you're attacking us, you're invading us. But these are words that can hurt. The participants who viewed the negative political rhetoric frequently included in their responses that they wrote such words as sad, upset, angry, hurt, offended, and they feel bad. Let me give you an example of a 24-year-old Mexican-American woman who, who wrote, <clears throat> anger, rage, frustration, impotence are just some of the words that come to mind. But I have so much to say that I'm not able to properly articulate what I'm trying to say, much less express myself in a healthy manner. These types of aggressions are not new to me. So what it's like to have these words and images being shouted at you, making you feel out of place, ashamed and inferior, even though you were born in the United States. So we had the standard, some standard psychological measures for stress, perceived health status, and perceived sense of well-being. And it became incredibly clear that exposure to the negative rhetoric we showed them significantly, statistically significantly raised stress levels compared to those who viewed positive rhetoric. Exposure to negative rhetoric significantly lowered perceived health status. People felt sick. They felt physically sick compared to those who saw the positive rhetoric. 
It significantly lowered their perceived well-being. They didn't feel good about themselves in the world. And these were statistics, statistically significant differences. Negative images and words can hurt, but what we found was positive rhetoric can also have a healthy effect. It makes people feel better about themselves when, you, when they see positive things being said. Those who viewed positive political rhetoric often used words such as proud, happy, benefit, empowered, contribution, and community. For example, a 19-year-old Mexican-American woman born in the United States said, as a Mexican-American, I feel proud <clears throat> reading the quotes and seeing the images. I feel very emotional because the present day individuals discriminate not only against immigrants, but their children. I am glad to see that we are contributing to society and I wish Americans could see that. I wish that they can see that we are not harming, in quotes, their country. We are helping making it grow. Exposure to positive pol media political rhetoric significantly reduced stress levels compared to those who viewed negative rhetoric. Exposure to positive media rhetoric significantly increased perceived health status. They felt healthy, they felt good, significantly increased their sense of well-being and belonging. I came to realize that words do matter. If we talk negatively about people, they feel bad, they feel stigmatized, like they don't belong. But if we speak positively about people, they feel good about themselves and their sense of belonging to the community and the nation. Scapegoating and blaming immigrants and Latinos for demographic changes may get some votes and listeners to talk shows, but the cost is great to individuals and to the goals of creating a unified nation. Thank you very much. I'll open up my talk to any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Leo. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to any questions or comments that people have, and I just wanted to go over how we're gonna proceed. So there are a couple of ways that we can do we can do this. So if you see at the bottom of your screen, at the far right of uh, the menu there, it's, there's this icon with a smiley face and a plus sign under which it says reactions. And there you can raise your hand. And if you do that, um, it'll notify me that you'd like to ask a question or, or make a comment. Um, alternatively, we have a chat, um, which is the third from the left option on your menu there, uh, in which you can write it out, write out a question or comment uh, if you're shy about going on camera. Uh, but we do encourage you, if you're not shy, to turn when you raise your hand and go on and cam uh, raise a question to do so with your camera on so that we can capture it on the on the recording, otherwise I'll just read it out. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take them questions or comments three at a time, um, if there's enough that warrants that, and then turn it over to Leo. So let's see. <clears throat> We've got a couple of comments in the chat, um, one of which says, has this study been published? If so, can you please provide a reference? Um, a second which says, in your research, have you drawn connections between this fear of demographic changes and the browning of American narrative and the ongoing attacks on Roe v. Wade and abortion rights? So those are two questions. And then we've got um, Ben Marquez who has his hand raised. So Ben, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and then you need to do that yourself, unmute yourself and go on camera. Looks like you're outside in front of Bascom Hall. Yes, that's exactly where I am. Uh, no, I'm, I'm at home right now trying to keep safe. Um, uh, uh, Leo, thank you very much for a terrific talk. I, I, really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I, um, I wanted to, what I wanted was to, um, to get your sense of, um, of Latino, Latino public opinion uh, on immigration. Uh, I... Um, um, Latinos of various nationalities, um, but mostly Mexican Americans, I think, uh, from what I've seen, are, are the most sympathetic to immigrants. Uh, on you know virtually any question you ask them, uh, they have the most sympathy and, and want to see uh, uh, immigrants treated uh, justly. Uh, but yet at the same time, you see other things like uh, uh, like not 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 very often a, a groundswell of support for immigrants. Um, Immigration dropping from the very top of the uh, of the list of important issues facing uh, Latinos in the United States, 
uh, and uh, a troubling and uh, uh, but persistent um, uh, tendency for Latinos to vote uh, for the Republican Party, you know, the very party that is really leading the charge uh, against immigrants. And so it's it's a it's it's a very mixed picture. And I and I was wondering, you know, what your uh, what your take is on that. Yeah, sure. Um, start with the first one uh, in terms of uh, published. Yeah, I, I can send you. I'll plan put them on here. I have to go to my Vita and copy the uh, the sites. But uh, uh, this has come out in Social Science and Medicine, uh, which is the more quantitative part of what we looked at. Um, uh, and uh, we, you know, we really analyzed the, um, the psychological effects. And uh, I can put that up there. And another article is coming out right now from um, Aslan. The, uh, uh, the Journal of uh, Chicano Studies at UCLA it looks at the qualitative responses uh, that I mentioned, like those quotes, but much more detail because we had lots, you know, lots of quotes. So look at the patterns uh, that came out. So that's coming out right now. So I can put that site up as well. And, um, <coughs> and, and so both of those sort of cover you know, two aspects of what we did in our study, the qualitative and the quantitative. Um, and so you might be interested in those. I'll, I'll definitely try and put those up. Um, <coughs> The, the fear of demographic change and the browning of America and Roe versus Wade and abortion rights. Um, you know, I, it, it, a direct line, a cause, causal line may be hard to draw, but the issue of Latina fertility has long been an issue in, in, uh, in many circles. Um, uh, you know, going all the way back to Stanford and Paul Ehrlich and his books on demographic change and the, the population bomb. And, you know, his main focus was Mexicans, you know, that they're basically out of control. And he compared them to, to, to locusts and who build these big nests and they explode because they can't contain them, right? And, and so you started seeing a lot of issues around, um, uh, you know, who should, who should give birth? Uh, should we control the birth, even if it's through means such as um, uh, eliminating the ability to have children for women? And so you see a lot of cases of, of immigrant women at the borders and other places being asked when they're giving birth to sign something in English. And it turns out they were signing uh, permission to, to uh, take away their ability to have children. And, um, and, you know, this, is there a direct cause relationship to those kinds of actions? Um, and more recently at the border, you saw once again, that was happening, right? I think this fear of Latina reproduction stimulates a lot of those attempts to control Latina fertility. And, um, and is the, some people might even say, well, you know, is it a direct link that Texas is one of the harshest abortion um, uh, bills in, in, in the country, in a, in a nation, in a state that has a lot of Latinas? And you have the rhetoric of them taking over and fertility. So, you know, can you say that the people who passed that law had that Latino fertility threat in their mind? You know, I, can, I can, can't say they didn't <laughs> either, right? Because there seems to be historically that set of ideas uh, that have been very prominent uh, in, in the way uh, uh, people have dealt with Latinas and their fertility rates. Um, now, in terms of, you know, pol politics, you know, back, back when George W. Bush II ran, and the son of George G. W., uh, you know, George Bush, 44% of Latinos voted for him, right? I mean, he, and why? Because you know, he was very personable. He would ask people to come into his kitchen in Texas and they talk about things like work, family, jobs, uh, uh, things that the people in Texas particularly, but Latinos in general seem to be, care about. And uh, you know, he was basically got a pretty large uh, part of the Latino vote. And um, yeah, because there are issues that Latinos care about that if Republicans weren't uh, so hell bent on caught stating them as, as the threat, but trying to develop a discourse of them coming to help save America, that's dwindling in terms of population, that's dwindling in terms of creativity, that's dwindling in terms of all these different things that immigrants bring, the values the, that they bring to America and started seeing that and, and, and reproducing that kind of narrative. Now, I think that they would find that immigrants in Latin America particularly, but immigrants from all over aren't necessarily as Republicans often think genetically 
Democrats. You know, they care about some similar issues about family, about work, uh, and uh, the future. And so it's um, it's the Republicans' fault if, if they're turning off Dem uh, Latinos in such vast numbers in many places of the country. What's interesting is, as, as Ben says, Southern Texas seems to be a place where the Latinos are voting for Democrats, I mean, for Republicans, which is kind of interesting. And I haven't seen a lot of good uh, public uh, or political science uh, analysis of why, except for some, some you know, some interesting things um, about the way they're representing what the Republican Party can do for them outside of immigration. And so it's a, it's, it's a mixed bag. You know, let, you know, many people come from different countries, relatively conservative in some ways, right? Um, and uh, relatively religious oftentimes and um, family oriented. And so, uh, you know, these aren't necessarily anti-Republican kind of issues. It's just that my point is that the trend among Republicans has been to narrow the tent, not to expand it. Uh, and um, it's been to their detriment. Take California, what we just had. We had a, a, a you know a recall of our governor, and um, uh, some some uh, Latinos thought maybe um, you know the Republicans made a good argument, um, but not everybody, as you can see, he, you know, our governor was beat the recall. So it's uh, I don't think it's always a cut and dry where uh, immigrants from Mexico or Latin America are Democrats. I think they they come. They, they're concerned about certain issues, one of which is immigration, but they're also concerned about economics, the future, family, education for their kids. And, you know, if you, you're going to do pretty well. Um, uh, it's just the Republican Party, like I said, hasn't gone after Latinos as much as they probably could. And, uh, and sorry, that was long winded, I know. All right, thank you very much. So Christina has a question and I'm gonna ask you to unmute as well as um, activate your camera. Okay, wonderful. I think I've done both of those things. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Christina Fullerton Rico. I'm a PhD student in the sociology department um, and I am so grateful to, to be here. I really admire your work, Professor Chavez. Um, and I think the questions that you're raising in this talk are really important. Um, one thing that, that I think um, you mentioned in your talk, but then also just in your response to the last question is um, from my perspective, the way that Latinos are being um, incentivized to whiteness and respectability politics in, um, in various ways. So I wondered if you could talk about this um, and if it came up in, in any of your research, because I think we see a lot of media rhetoric of um, Latinos saying, well, you know, I'm not like them, right? So this idea of like, documented versus undocumented immigrants. Um, and then also, even in thinking about census categories, um, the, the fact that we have to check non-Hispanic white or Hispanic white um, versus Hispanic black and where those categories came from. Um, so I know that you really take a historical view and I wondered if you could talk about um, where those categories emerged from, because they feel very different from how most people identify in real life. Well, I mean, as you know, categories are invented. <laughs> they, they just didn't exist in, in natural um, thinking. Uh, and, you know, and so the, you know, the word Hispanic was constructed by the Census Bureau. The word Latino later was sort of constructed to look for pan words that would sort of encompass a lot of different ethnic groups, right? And you, say, you can say thing, the same thing with Asian American, right? So that they aren't just Koreans, they aren't just Japanese, they aren't just Filipinos, in order to create some sort of larger political base. But the, your question about, you know, how do people see themselves and why some people would, would claim they're not, I'm this, not that. And, and that goes to the whole idea of divide and conquer and, and the divisiveness that this political rhetoric really sort of creates because when you stigmatize a certain part of the population, who wants to be in that stigmatized group? I, I remember back in the 1950s, this is way before your time, uh, uh, but I remember uh, in those days, because I was a little kid and I remember my mother and everybody, they were having Operation Wetback 
And they would look at each other and say, who, you know, we're not wetbacks. Who are wetbacks? Because they're stigmatizing Mexicans who come to work, try and make a decent living for themselves and their family. Pretty much honest people who are being rounded up, picked up as criminals off the streets of Los Angeles and being called wetbacks. Well, you've now stigmatized this whole category of people. And many people say, want to say, look, I'm not in that category. I mean, that's what happens, right? And you take the term anger baby, you construct this category of citizens who are threat to the United States because they're here to, as a conspiracy against the United States. Well, many people are gonna say, well, I'm not an anchor baby, right? Why, why are you putting me in that group? And it creates divisiveness, it's divide and conquer. And that's what stigma does in a society. It, it's, it's, it, it creates us and them kinds of mentalities. And unfortunately, it, it can even do that within particular groups because they don't wanna be stigmatized along with people that other people outside of them are putting them into the same category, right? It's, it's a real dangerous thing, but it's, a, it's, an old, it's an old thing too, right, unfortunately. <clears throat> In terms of the census, I mean, those <clears throat> ideas about what box are you gonna check off, you know, these are all, in a very Foucaultian way, ways of governing the population, right? To get people information for the government to feel how they're gonna basically govern us and putting us into categories that they can then, of the population, they can now do things to help control us. That's my attitude. And we don't have to check off anything. I remember I went to a talk a long time ago in the census when, and, um, in Washington, DC, and um, the, the, the head of the INS and, and had the people there who were training people for, I think it was like the 1990 or 2000 census. And they were complaining because they said Mexicans don't want to sign the uh, or fill out the, the race part. And, and they're the largest group of people, when they get the census, they'll put Latino, they'll put Mexican origin, they'll put this, but they leave blank race. And so they're mad. In fact, one of the one of the census takers who was being trained, who was a PhD in sociology or anthropology, I can't remember, came up to me and said, Hey, you know what they were telling us in the training session? And I said, What? And he said, You know, a lot of these Mexicans aren't going to want to tell you what their race is because they don't believe in that. And but the so when you just look at them and you mark off, you think they're white, black, or what? You fill it out. I mean, it was unbelievable, right? And I, and I think that, you know, for example, myself, you know, I don't put race. I either put down, I just write down other, all or none, your pick. <laughs> because there's no way anybody of Latino origin doesn't have every one of those categories in their genetic makeup. I'll put down the ethnic part, but I'm not gonna let them, I'm not gonna self-categorize into their boxes. It just doesn't make sense, right? It just doesn't fit. And so to me, it's, it's, a, it's about power because knowledge is power and they're just trying to figure out ways to, to deal with that. It, and, and then, you know, on, on the positive side, <clears throat> the category mixed has really been interesting because the increase as the 2020 census shows us that one of the biggest increases in population has been among mixed categories. And what's a mixed category? I mean, Latinos are mixed for 500 years, right? So in a sense, America's following the trend that people from Latin America have already sort of established for 500 years of being mixed. And so that, that's an interesting category. Um, and the, also the idea of non-Hispanic white versus white is difficult because you know, many Latinos claim to be white and, and the US government puts them in the white category generally as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe, right? Because Mexico said, we're not gonna sign the Treaty of Guadalupe <laughs> if you don't allow people who are in, Mex in the United States after the transfer to US power to become citizens. And at the time, only whites could become citizens. So America was caught in this dilemma because no one saw Mexicans as whites. They were called mulattoes, they were called mixed breeds, they were called Indians. No one said, hey, we've got a bunch of white people in Texas and California, New Mexico now. And so, but the government said, fait accompli, okay, they can stay, you sign it, give us your country, half your country, and we'll let them be citizens, they're gonna be white, right? And that became one of the ways that, that Mexicans avoided some issue, but they didn't avoid, unfortunately, the Jim Crow laws because they were white by definition, but not white by implementation of Jim Crow laws. And so throughout the Southwest, you had people who weren't allowed to go to certain beaches, they weren't allowed to go to certain pools at certain times of the week, all, all kinds of issues, right? And so this white, non-white category in practice sometimes wasn't very, very well implemented. And, um, and so, you know, what, what's interesting is that what whiteness really means is, is not a fixed category anyway. It's all changing, it's always gonna change, and we have no idea what it's gonna be like by 2060 anyway. So when you project the white population 
versus non-Hispanic white, we don't even know what that category is going to be in 40 years, 20 years, right? Because it changed everything. The way we view things changes so, so much so fast. Because these categories aren't real. They're made up. They're inventions, right? I'm not sure if I answered your question, but that's the way I sort of see it. Um, I'm sure your work will take us to much more greater insights than I have. All right, well, we've got uh, now three other people who have asked questions, um, one of which is a follow-up from Amita Miranda, which is, she's referring to the same study that she asked about earlier. She's curious to know how students and participants were debriefed during your study, particular or especially those who are shown the negative images. The second question comes from Shane Boder. I hope I pronounced that correct. Lee, um, how do you expect the quote unquote imaging and discourse around Afghan refugees to evolve given the current rhetoric blaming Biden for leaving deserving people behind while thousands of needy, often undocumented Afghans are arriving in states like Wisconsin? And then thirdly, um, Mariana asks, how do you envision racist rhetoric around Latinos, Latinas um, to change or shift, if at all, given that we're projected to comprise one third of the population comparable to whites? So those are three questions. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, they're all really good questions. Um, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, if I was writing this, if I was writing the Latino threat in the 1850s and 60s, I would have called it the Chinese threat. Uh, if I was to write it in the, I could have written it also maybe the Chinese slash Irish threat. If I was writing in the late, late 1800s, early 1900s, I could have called it the, the uh, South, Southern and Eastern European threat. Unfortunately, a lot of the tropes that I'm looking at aren't new, right? They've been consistent for Mexicans and Latinos, but they aren't new. And, and they build on similar tropes used against other peoples in other times. And clearly, you know, the issue of what's going on now with the new refugees coming to the United States is going to have a whole, you know, bunch of, of rhetoric around it by people who, whose major goal is to promote anti-immigrant ideas or pro-immigrant ideas. And they're going to shade the way they're thinking about the new refugees coming along those lines. And it, unfortunately, it's not going to be the actions of any these of individuals coming and how righteous they are, or how forthright they are, or how honest they are, it's going to be all shaded through interpretations to make an arguments about immigration, about Biden doing a bad job or a good job. Can America hold more refugees who aren't European? I mean, it's all going to become part of these larger narratives. Um, and unfortunately, actually, I mean, if I was writing in the 1940s, 30s and 40s, I'd talk about the Japanese threat. I mean, and we see what happened there. Um, and so I think what's going to be going on is we're going to have about a, a number, probably 10 years of narrative construction around the new refugees and their threats to certain communities in America, unfortunately. But, but I think what people are going to find is, it, just like in past flows, that the majority of people are going to come in and, and um, they're going to try to do the best they can under very harrowing circumstances in the face of obstacles and attitudes. And, uh, and try to make a life. And in the end, hopefully, people will, will find a way to respect that. But I, I can't predict how that's going to work out because we've seen so many uh, in the past, nativism has been a constant thread whenever we've had new flows of people. Um, you know, we had anti-Cuban, Haitian, Jamaican, Mexican. I mean, I could use, it's, it's continuous, right? So I don't anticipate it's going to be much different for the new flows of refugees. It's going to be very difficult. Uh, what happened, it's unfortunately, sometimes the greatest opposition can be from groups who were previously migrants themselves, who kind of now feel that this new group is coming and, and imposing upon the hard earned benefits they themselves have helped create in a community. And I remember back in the, when I was writing Shadow Lives, some of the most virulent anti Southeast Asian comments came from Mexican, Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans who said, well, you're inundating our clinics. I can't get in to see my doctor, right? I interviewed one, and I interviewed one guy who was about 55 years old in Chula Vista, who was a green card holder from Mexico. And he was telling me how these Salvadorans and Nicaraguans and, and Hondurans shouldn't be here. They're taking our jobs. They're, they're, just, they're just destroying everything. 
And he said, I said, these foreigners. I said, you know, some people might call you a foreigner. He said, yeah, but I was here first. And I, you know, I said, unfortunately, each new wave like this finds nativism um, coming from the larger community that may be here for generations, but also from the more recent previous group of people who, who feel a threat, who feel that somehow they're going to now lose out. And uh, that kind of goes back to your idea of stigma that I, I kind of raised. And, you know, it, it, when you create us versus them, um, a lot of times people want to be on the us, even if it means representing those others in ways that are so negative, you can't believe they're negative, <laughs> right? How can you do that? I tell you, some of my most virulent hate mail comes from people who claim they themselves are immigrants. And how can I say this about immigration being good for these people? Now, my people came right. My people stood in line. My people came legal. My people did this. And, and, and yet, these themselves are people who came as immigrants and faced incredible obstacles. We just turn it around and, 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 and repeat a negative address. So I don't know what to tell you. In terms, I can't predict the future. I just think the newcomers coming are going to face a lot of hurdles. And it's going to be take a lot of hard work from people who are academics, people interested in social justice, people interested in, in providing community support to figure out ways to, to deal with what they're going to encounter. Uh, in terms of how it's going to change for Latinos, you know, it's really hard to say. Another thing, I mean, I like to say that in the future, um, that as we become much stronger part of the population, that the anti-immigrant rhetoric for Latinos and anti-Latino rhetoric will die down. And I think in a place like California, where we do control a lot of, of what happens in our legislature, right? We, you know, we're pretty strong in California. We, our rules and laws for providing healthcare and education for undocumented students is pretty strong. And, um, and I think a lot of the people who try and promote in my in Southern California, the anti-immigrant idea faced a lot of opposition from people um, because of, the, you know, we have a much longer history and, and much stronger political presence. We have people who are lawyers, we have people who are journalists, we have people who are on TV who can help, you know, counter some of that. But when you have people going into a community that's a relatively new destination point where people aren't used to having foreigners, where they aren't used to seeing people using different languages. They aren't used to the smell of the spices, the taste of the food, the dress people have. Then you have more, more problems, I think. Um, and I think in the future, where Latinos are gonna come down on that, um, I mean, there's, you could say there's gonna be two or three roads. One road would be that they assume the mantle of those protecting what they now are creating as American culture and the new people coming in are a threat to that. So they could pick up that mantle or they could remember their past and say, you know what, we're not gonna fall into the same trap and say that you know, everybody's coming here are a threat to the way of life. We recognize that they're gonna change America just like we changed it and America's gonna be strong. So those narratives are there. How Latinos are gonna go with those are really hard, hard to say. Um, you know, we already have the outliers who say, who take up that very, anti-immigrant mantle as a way of, of getting, you know, votes or, or whatever. And, you know, it's, it's always kind of disgusting to me that they forget who they are and they forget that, that they had to go through these problems and they're willing to forego that just so they can become, you know, uh, you know voted in in a particular party or, or get their people listening to their talk shows. And it's, it's pretty sad, actually. And I, but I hopefully the minority and not the trend for Latinos in the future. It's, it's so hard to say. What's going to happen is we become the future of the nation. We're already the future of California. So I would say, look to California and see how we're doing, right? And I mean, for example, my campus, Anglos are already probably 12%, 14% of my student body. Uh, and as I tell people when I give talks, you know, people treat them nice. You know, they talk to them when they're walking down the campus. They, we allow some white guys on the basketball team. We gave them all the water polo team. And so it's sort of like, you know, there hasn't been that kind of conflict. And so I think, even though the fear, as, as I said in 1990, what happens when you become the minority and people treat you so bad? Well, you know, where is that happening? That's my, that'd be my question. And I think Latinos are bringing a whole different way of thinking about life. Latinos come with a mixed racial heritage. They, aren't, they, didn't, they don't have the history of the one drop rule, like much of the United States. 
Well, if you're 164th black, you're black. No, Latinos come mixed. So they're bringing a whole different way of thinking about race and ethnicity and identity <clears throat> that I think is gonna make America a much stronger and richer place when, when they have much more a part of helping construct who we are. And, uh, and you can just go down the list and thinking about music, food, education, the way kids are raised, all kinds of things, right? Um, importance of family, I mean, there's all kinds of things that hopefully will make a difference in the future. Um, I can't predict. I just know that demographically we're here more of us are gonna be here in the future. And what we do with that creates an incredible responsibility for us to make sure we do it better than what we encountered for the last century when, we, when we, our land was taken over. I say our land because my family's been here in the United States since the early 1600s in New Mexico. And so, you know, I, so I use it that way. You know, a, lot of, a lot of problems have occurred over the last 150, 200 years. The issue for us is how do we do it better? How do we make a difference? And so people in a hundred years from now would say, my God, they really made a difference. That's a responsibility that I don't know how we're gonna come up to answer with, but I'm hoping we do. I don't know what to ask you to say any more than that. Um, in terms of how we debrief people, there really was, I, I, I'll send you, I'll put up here if I can, or I'll send it to the, the group here about the, um, the articles. So you can take a look on that. There really wasn't much time for debriefing um, in terms of just going back and because we didn't want to, you know, more students were taking this experiment, right? And so we couldn't basically reveal a lot of what we were trying to do uh, and what we were trying to accomplish with this. And so it wasn't really a chance where we could do that. Hopefully now I use my articles and classes so people can see them. And um, if they were, you know, and if they were participating in it, they can send us a letter and say, hey, whatever happened to that? You can give us a copy. And I think they'd enjoy what the outcomes were um, and what they saw. But uh, yeah, we didn't get a chance to debrief them too much without contaminating future interviews. But I'll send you the papers, you can take a look. All right, so I think that we have a question from Armando, but other than that, we have, the queue is open. So anybody who would like to ask a question or make a comment, um, you, this is a great opportunity. So either do that via the chat or um, raise your hand and you can go on camera. So Armando, didn't you have a question? Come. I didn't. Um, I, I think I was I was using the clapping and the thumbs up um, in agreement with what Leo was saying. But but I do have a, a just a comment and and maybe maybe a, a, a question that comes with a comment. And and Leo, I mean you you have given us a framework to study um, discourse and um, cultural for some of us that do cultural political economy with the Latino threat narrative and really um, providing us that, that framework um, to, 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 try to, to try to understand the, 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 the social dynamics around race or perceptions of race in, in the US. Um, I think, that, uh, I think that, that Ben asked earlier about why do Latinos vote you know, for Republicans or vote against their own interests? Um, what, what, what seems to be their own interest and, um, and, and how has that, you know, taken itself, uh, how has that manifested itself? You know, the same questions could be um, raised around class and around the politics of, of class and people from, from different class groups voting against their interests. Um, I wonder um, if, if there's, a, well, I, I'm not wondering, I think that there's a, a direct, um, a direct um, relationship between um, between you know labor migration from Mexico and settlement in the U.S. and subsequent generations how they how they integrate and and, and become a part of the whole whatever that means Leo um, and so could you talk more to the class aspect of the Latino threat narrative? Sure, I think um, what's interesting I think about the way the Latino threat narrative works is that a lot of it cuts across class because for a lot of people who use those ideas that Latinos are just taking, Latinos uh, you know, are, are criminals, a lot of them are using it in such a homogenous way. You, you wonder what's going on. And so uh, even if they're politicians or they're well off, they might even still say they're criminals because they must've gotten their money in some other way. So in a way, some of those threats cut across class. But in terms of voting patterns, I think class probably does make an interest. And I think in the sense that when people feel that 
people who are elites don't really remember them as Latinos, working class Latinos, that they just disregard their interests um, or they treat them in ways that they expect them to vote for them because they they should be Democrats because we're doing good for you and therefore you should vote for us. That can turn some people off. And let me give you an example. I remember when um, uh, I went to see Henry Cisneros, he was giving a talk and um, he, he was talking about the fact that you had um, George Bush uh, and then you had, I think it was at the time, who was he? He was running against, uh, uh, and he didn't become president. He lost, He actually won, but Florida overturned it. Um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, you know, he he's, does all the environmental things. Um, huh? Al Gore. Al Gore. And so Cisneros was telling us a, sto a story that he said typifies how Latinos, at least in Texas, think. And so you had Al Gore come and was talking to the to uh, Tejanos, Texas, Texas Mexicans, and he stood way back from them. And his pull point was how much the, in, the Democratic Party has done for them and they owe them and should vote for him. He said, then he goes and sees George Bush. And George Bush says, you know, comes over, he's very folksy, he stands right with them. He's rubbing elbows with them, patting people on the back. They're having a beer together. And there he's talking, you know, what are your issues? What do you want? What can I do for you? He got 44% of the vote. People didn't like Al Gore. He said, this guy doesn't know us. He doesn't really care about us. He doesn't, he's not engaging us. And I think that those issues, you know, may be class oriented or they may be just the way politics works and how people perceive how somebody may not have. Now, whether Bush had their interests at heart, I have no idea. Although he did try to get, you know, immigration reform and all kinds of issues passed, but, you know, he was obviously, obviously bad in other areas. But uh, it, it, I think we're talking about style here and perception of, of politicians as elites, who if you're a working class person, you got to get a sense, do they really care, right? Do they really have my interests at heart? Are they really asking me about my views? And I think those things, uh, particularly for working class folks who are, who are interested in that kind of seeing what, how people want to treat them, who are sensitive to that, that can be pretty important. Um, you know, somebody who's a professor, uh, you know, may read the candidate's positions, have a, a, a different sense, and may never, you know, may not really care about, because they already have it sort of figured out. You know, but if, you know, that may not be true for everybody at, at, at different class levels who really want to get a sense of that person, all right, and how they want to come, come and deal with them. Although I think at any level, even professors, we might want to see somebody think, well, what are your views really about? <laughs> but um, that, so I think, I think uh, Cisneros was pretty on target. And what's interesting is no one has, it's, the Republican Party hasn't really followed up on the George Bush, G.W. Bush example of how to get Latinos to vote for them, to really ask them what, you know, what their interests are. They sort of just continue to, to say, well, they're going to be Democrats anyway. Why do we? Sh why should we even care? Which is definitely the wrong way to go. That's. I'm not advocating to vote for Republicans. I'm just trying to point out what I see. You know, uh, so if and if you're promoting people who promote the, the Latino threat continually, that's going to turn off a bunch of people who are going to say, well, they really don't care for my interests theoretically. <laughs>